sea ice is the biggest obstacle for Antarctic sea travel. In 1911, Douglas Mawson encountered plenty of it as his Australasian Antarctic expedition approached the frozen continent. So Mawson couldn't believe his luck when his ship, Aurora, sailed into ice-free waters off Commonwealth Bay on the eastern extremity of the Australian Antarctic Territory. Well over 1,000 kilometres from where the nearest Australian station, Casey, is now located. Douglas Mawson drew his people mainly from universities. They were young scientists, not builders. Mostly in their early 20s, and with little or no experience of building or construction. Yet, only 15 days after landing, they had erected and were occupying their living quarters. And within four weeks, the adjacent second hut was complete. 18 men occupied this tiny living area. They had a gramophone, and that played a very important role in the life inside the hut. It provides a little insight to life inside the living quarters of the hut, which was barely 60 square meters. The center of activity was the two huts about 400 meters east of the main hut. Here, 22-year-old physicist Eric Webb and his successor Robert Bage spent many hours observing, measuring and verifying magnetic field variations. Little did we imagine when we landed in calm sunshine that we had established ourselves in the most tempest-ridden spot on the face of the globe. Sir Douglas Mawson, knighted for his exploits in 1915, called Commonwealth Bay the home of the blizzard, with wind gusts regularly exceeding 300 kilometers per hour and the average wind strength just over 90 kilometers per hour. They all developed the technique of hurricane walking, leaning into the wind at crazy angles. It was an inexact art. Daily weather and scientific observations were carried out despite the savage screaming wind. The main hut was immediately almost completely buried in snow. Nearly 100 years later, weathered but not beaten, both structures remain. Testament to the hut's simple but sturdy design and the expedition's commitment and ingenuity. But piece by piece, this remarkable monument of the work of Australia's greatest polar explorer was being blown away. In December 1997, the Mawson's Huts Foundation sent a team of 11 men and two women to Commonwealth Bay to try and stabilize the huts and help ensure they're conserved as an important Australian icon. 30 tons of ice was carefully removed from the living quarters so that repairs could be made. Upon entering the hut, the team emerged into another world. They got through to the living section. There they found a frozen time capsule, books, artifacts, and the explorer's bunks, just as they had left them when Mawson and his team departed late in 1913. Photographer Frank Hurley's darkroom was entered for the first time in almost a century. The items that Hurley left behind provided a further insight into hut life and the character of a young man who would go on to become not only the most famous of Antarctic photographers, but possibly Australia's most important wartime photographer. When the skylight covers were removed, sunlight flooded into Mawson's room for the first time in over 90 years. Skylight covers and gaps in the roof planking were patched to stop snow and ice getting in. Two of the outbuildings, the Absolute Magnetic Hut and the Transit Hut were in bad shape. 
but their frames were rehabilitated by using original timbers found in the ice nearby. The Magnetograph house roof needed recladding, its door rehung, and minor internal repairs. The cross arms of the memorial dedicated to Ninnis and Mertz, two of Mawson's young team who died while exploring with Mawson, were refixed to the post on the hill overlooking the bay. But the years have taken their toll, and the fragile Baltic pine used on the roof has been reduced from 100 millimetres to less than 10 by the relentless battering from ice and snow being driven at high speed.